the course of this series, we've looked at three important aspects of ethics. First, we considered our motive, the internal heart attitudes, that these are important for ethics. Second, we looked at our goal, that is, what, are the, what is the outcome of our actions? What is the situation involved in our actions? That's an important consideration in ethics. Finally, we began looking at the standard, that is, the law. In our case, as Christians, the law of God, the fact that there is a standard of right and wrong. We've seen what the law of God is good for and what it is not good for, that it is not to be used to earn salvation, but it is there to show us the will of God. It shows us the character of God. It shows us how we are to live as his children. So now we want to spend the rest of this course looking at the Ten Commandments as a summary of the standard of God, a summary of God's law. So first, let's consider the preface of the Ten Commandments. If you read this in Exodus chapter 20, that's where we're going to be looking most of the time. Exodus 20, the preface in Exodus 20, verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, the Ten Commandments, the law of God in general, fits in with the general pattern of ancient Near Eastern treaties. Now, you can get into discussions as to whether God's presentation of the law came first and then the ancient Near Eastern treaties were modeled on that, or whether God gave his law in terms, in the form of the ancient Near Eastern treaties that already existed. Either way, this is coming from God. But in ancient Near Eastern treaties that we have found in other sources, we see that there's a pattern to these treaties. When one country would conquer another country is what we're talking about here. When a king conquered a nation, he would establish a treaty with that nation. And the first part of that treaty was self-identification. That is, he would say, who is the king? Who am I? And so here, in the preface, we see who the king is. God identifies himself. He says, I am Jehovah. I am the Lord, our God. That word Lord is God's personal name. He uses his personal name with us. It's not just a generic deity. He is a personal God who is speaking his law to us. He's not just some far off principle. He is our God, and notice that he is our God. He says, I am the Lord, your God. He's not just a distant, detached God. He is ours. But that's the historical identification. That's his self-identification that God makes. Who is he? The second aspect of an ancient Near Eastern treaty was the historical background. What has the king done? What has led up to making this treaty? Well, in, with secular kings, he would say, well, I've conquered you, I've built you roads, I've provided armies for you, I've done this, I've done this, that type of thing. There would be a listing of what that king has done. Well, here in the preface to the Ten Commandments, God reminds his people what he's done for them. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now again, this shows us the redemptive focus of the law. You see, God gave the people the Ten Commandments after he saved them out of Egypt. He didn't wait for the people to obey the law before he delivered them, but he graciously saved them in spite of their rebellion. And now he says, okay, I have saved you. I have done this for you. Therefore, you shall keep my commandments. This is how you are to live in response to my salvation. Now, the next parts of the ancient Near Eastern treaties included the stipulations or the laws. That is, here's what you're supposed to do as my subjects. You're supposed to pay taxes. You're supposed to do this. You're to do that. They included sanctions. That is, there were blessings if they obeyed. You know, if you pay your taxes properly, I will pr protect you from uh, enemies who invade. I will do this. If you don't pay taxes, if you don't follow my laws, then I'm going to come in and you know, take your women as my slaves and that type of thing. Okay, there will be blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. 
As we go through the Ten Commandments, some of these are included there and others are explained more fully later in other parts of the law. There were also, in the ancient Near Eastern treaties, provisions for succession, that is, how you preserve these documents, who the heirs are going to be, and so on. Uh, for example, as you go down through the law uh, in the Old Testament in Exodus, God said, I want you to make copies of this. Here's where I want you to keep them. That follows that pattern. So anyway, God's law follows the pattern of these ancient Near Eastern treaties, and that helps us. So that's the preface. That's the foundation for the Ten Commandments. Again, remember, it's because God has saved us that he gives us his law. So now, let's look at the first commandment. The first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. So there's a positive aspect to this law. Now, all of the commandments in imply both a positive and a negative. Okay, the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith, the Westminster Shorter and Larger Catechisms deal with this. But when God says, do not do something, it implies a positive action. Likewise, when a, he gives a positive command, honor your father and mother, it implies prohibiting the negative. So for each of the commandments, we're going to look at what's the positive command, what's the negative. Here, the positive command is that we are to give total loyalty and love to God. Deuteronomy 6. See, we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We give him our complete loyalty, okay, total loyalty, total allegiance. And he says, you shall have no other gods before me. That doesn't mean, you know, in priority over me. Before me means in my face. That whatever we do, we are in the face of God. Uh, our school has a slogan, uh, Coram Deo, in the face of God, before the face of God. We live our lives before his face. So if we have another God, it is in his face. I mean, we have this saying and slang today, you know, don't, don't get in my face. Uh, that's the attitude here. But we are to be totally committed to God. Think about the ancient Near Eastern treaties again. It would be treasonous for the subject country to start uh, swearing loyalty to another king for them to say, okay, we're going to start serving another king. That's treason. And so God is saying here, that's treason for you to have other gods before me. So we love God. The negative of this obviously is there are to be no false gods. Okay, in our day, you know, we're, we generally don't have to deal with pagan gods. We don't have people setting up little idols in their uh, apartments, that type of thing. But instead, we need to stay away from undue devotion to something other than God. We can be devoted to and place other things a priority over God, whether it's our money, whether it's our job, whether it's success in our family, whether it's our children. All of these we can place as an idol in our hearts. So we need to avoid that. We also need to stay away from false ideas about God. This is also a violation of this commandment because then we have some God that is other than the God who has defined himself in the Bible. Uh, for example, you hear it say sometimes that uh, Christians and Jews worship the same God. Well, we don't. We don't worship the same God. Christians worship the true God, a God who is triune, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the true God. Jews worship some other God who is some type of unity who is not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a false God. That is another God. We have to see that. Okay. The concept of open theism, a God that doesn't even know what's going to happen in the future. That's a, been a kind of a fad in Christian theology in recent years. Cults, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and so on, they have another God, not the God of the Bible. Okay, so, we ha so the first commandment forbids having false gods, but also forbids having false ideas about God. 
So how does this apply in our day? One issue is the issue of tolerance. Now, I've heard it said that that is the one value in our culture that is supreme above all is tolerance. And there are several ways this concept of tolerance is used in our day. One is this idea of religious pluralism, that there are many ways to God. Now, in our generally non-Christian culture, the word salvation is not usually used outside the church, but people will talk about many roads to God or many roads to heaven. They will say that God is a gracious and loving God and is willing to accept anyone who seeks him or her sincerely, no matter what they call him or her, if it's God, Jehovah, Buddha, the great deity, Mother Earth, or whatever. So these are all valid ways to God. That's considered tolerance. Is this true? Well, of course not. Scripture plainly teaches that no one comes to God but through Christ, John 14, 6. Peter plainly said there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4.12. Now that Acts verse is also important because in Peter's day the common saying was that there was no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved than the name of Caesar. So we have to say that all those who do not trust in Jesus Christ for salvation are lost and are without hope in the world. Now that doesn't mean that we show ungodly hatred towards unbelievers. We should have personal tolerance. That is, we don't take up arms against unbelievers simply because of unbelief. We don't treat them as less than human. We don't treat them as idiots. You know, this is a biblical view of tolerance. If my next door neighbor is an unbeliever, I don't go around, I don't burn his house down, I you know, don't attack him, these types of things. I witness to him, I can tell him about Christ, but there's a tolerance in that, okay, he's labeled to live in peace, I wish for peace for him, you know, that type of thing. There are things that we do, that's tolerance. But in our day, the word tolerance has come to mean accepting something is equally valid. We've seen this with the homosexual issue. Uh, tolerance in the sense of, okay, there are gays in our culture and I'm not going around trying to kill them. That's what I believe. That would be my view of tolerance. But the world's view of tolerance is that I have to validate homosexuality. I have to say it is an acceptable lifestyle. And so when we say, even as loving and as kindly as we possible that non-Christians are not going to heaven in modern society, that in itself is considered intolerant. See, when I say tolerant, I mean not displaying unrighteous anger or malice. So, in the eyes of many, we are inevitably going to be guilty of intolerance. Now, another issue. How do we deal with false religion in the church? Do we separate? What do we call heresy? Is a preacher or a church heretical when they deny the deity of Christ? What about if they deny the resurrection of Christ? What about if they deny six-day creation? If they deny predestination? What if they deny infant baptism? What if they are not post-millennialists? What if their women do not cover their heads in worship? See, where do we draw the line between what is error and what is heresy? In the history of the church, heresy means you are denying the faith, that you are considered outside the realm of Christianity. Now, I think we all see that there are degrees of error. and There comes a point when that error has crossed the line into denying the essentials of the faith, or what uh, Machen in the early part of the 20th century called the fundamentals. This is where the term fundamentalism came from, what he called the fundamentals of the faith. Now, generally, I see that as being defined by the early creeds of the church, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. These define who is a Christian and who is not. 
That's what they were intended to do. Later confessions, such as the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Belgic Confession, were meant to define systematically all that the church believes. But nobody who wrote the Westminster Standards, for example, believed that you had to agree to every point of the Westminster Confession in order to be saved. They said this is the systematic teaching of the church, but this is not the essence of saving faith. Now we have to be careful because of the camel's nose problem. I mean, you know the story about the camel sticking its nose under the tent and gradually soon the whole camel is inside the tent. Well, if we deny predestination, for example, that can lead to denying the sovereignty of God in general, which can then lead to denying God's knowledge of future events, which is open theism, which then leads basically to denying that God is God. In fact, any theological error, if you trace its logical conclusions, can lead to a wholesale denial of the faith. Fortunately, none of us is consistent. We all have some type of error, but none of us takes those errors to their logical conclusion. The Lord keeps us from that. He keeps us from denying the faith. He keeps us inconsistent with the errors that we have. But let's get back to the question now. When should we separate from apostate churches or denominations? When have they crossed the line? And I think that's a judgment each person needs to make. It might be that you live in a rural area, and the only church in that area is a fairly liberal church. See, this is looking at the situation you're in. You know, Maybe it's not a completely apostate church, but it has a lot of errors, like maybe there are women preachers. And it could be that I need to stay there if that's the only option for me. But if I'm in an area where I can go to another church, where there's a Bible-believing church, then I do that. Likewise with denominations. When I was in seminary uh, in the mid-70s, uh, many preachers and churches were facing this decision. Uh, especially in the South, you had the PCUS, uh, the old Southern Presbyterian Church. Uh, and it was slowly denying the faith. It would start denying the infallibility of Scripture or different areas of the faith. And so preachers and churches had to make a decision. Do we need to leave the PCUS and form a new denomination? That was where the PCA came from in the early 70s. You see, the whole denomination, the denomination as a whole, the PCUS, was moving away from the faith, but individual churches were able to continue preaching the truth. You had many churches, especially in small rural areas, where there were faithful, godly preachers, and the church was holding on to the faith. But soon the denomination started requiring things like acceptance of women preachers, and so churches decided we can no longer remain in this denomination. So that it's not an easy question. There's not something where I can say, here are a set of rules, follow these steps, and this will tell you if you should leave your church or if your church should leave its denomination. It's something that you need to consider, some issues you need to consider as to when you are able to continue being faithful to the Lord and when you are not able to continue. Now in the next video, we're going to look at the second and third commandments. So before you watch that video, I have a couple of questions I want you to think about. First, let's say you're a kindergarten teacher. Can a kindergarten teacher show picture, pictures of Jesus to her class when she teaches a Bible lesson? Another question to consider. You're a high school English teacher in a Christian school. How do you deal with literature that has some profanities and obscenities in it? Think about those questions, and then we'll deal with those in our next video.